Welcome to the Thyroid Fixer Podcast, where I'm all about helping you lose that stubborn weight that won't come off no matter what you do. Get off your couch at 2 p.m. and get through your day with energy and stop counting the hairs that come out of your head. I'm your host, Dr. Amy, and I'm here to help you get optimized with your thyroid and your hormones. It's all part of living our mantra, better thyroid, better hormones equals a better life. So let's get you back to being the badass human that you're meant to be. Let's approach it from a thyroid and hormone optimization standpoint. Between myself and my guests, you will be loaded down with information to take control of your health and get back to being you. So let's get started. Have you ever heard of the baobab fruit? It's really interesting. And it is such an affordable way to increase your antioxidants because this thing is a multi-talented, multivitamin, multi-mineral, one-of-a-kind supplement in powder form that you throw into your shakes. Oh my God, it just pretty much becomes a no-brainer. So this particular Baobab Boost from Trim Healthy Mama, my two favorite ladies on the planet, they introduced me to this amazing antioxidant and I fell in love. I put it in all the time. Every single shake that I have, I put the Baobab powder in. It's citrus and sherbet tasting dried flesh, has five times the fiber of oats, and a higher antioxidant level than any food on the planet. That's eight times that of the super berry acai and more than blueberries and pomegranates combined. So quit eating all the sugar and just use organic baobab fruit pulp. It's that easy. Because Trim Healthy Mama, they put that into a nice powder. Like I said, I just scoop it right out, throw it into my shake. Oh my gosh, it reduces inflammation and helps with weight loss. And the other really interesting thing about it is it's kind of working as an appetite suppressant. Now, I know it's not touted for that, but when you put it in your shake, especially first thing in the morning, throw that into a nice protein shake, you'll notice that your appetite is definitely curbed. So now I'm thinking of this perfect stack to replace or or supplement those GLPs out there on the market. What if we did Baobab and Metabolism Fixer together? That would be crazy at controlling your appetite. And with the Baobab, you're getting all those antioxidants. It's, it's amazing. And this powder is so affordable. It is so affordable. So you're going to go to store.trimhealthymama.com And look up Baobab. It's B-A-O-B-A-B, Baobab Boost Powder. Uh, These ladies have just gone all out with their entire line. But this is one of my favorites because I started using it. And I have to say that I noticed the appetite suppression difference. And then when I dove down the rabbit hole of what else is in it, the antioxidant content, the multi-mineral content, it just becomes a no-brainer. So store.trimhealthymama.com. Look for Baobab powder. Enjoy. So this is going to be a game changer for you. And you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the Fixer line is Metabolism Fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight that need help in the weight loss department that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there. You know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight. Add in metabolism fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2 which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control 
over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form, so you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. If you have not yet heard Dr. Kate Shanahan speak about seed oils and how they literally damage your health, cause weight gain, brain fog, low energy, and yeah, cancer, then you need to listen to this interview. I started following Kate Shanahan years ago when she was talking about the downfalls of seed oils and the hateful eight. And since then, she's written two books and her latest book, Dark Calories, came out and I read that and I said, you know what, we we need to revisit this. We need to get her on the show because this could be another game changer in your health. So if you're out there and you can't lose weight and you still have brain fog and you have low energy and you just can't figure it out, you have this air hunger, you have cravings, and you're really actually interested in staving off cancer, then this episode is for you because you're going to learn so much, so many jaw-dropping, eye-opening moments in our discussion that you absolutely will leave after an hour with more information on how to literally change your health now and how to change your health for the long run how we end is really how do you want to die? Do you want to just die of old age as a badass going out kicking and screaming? Or do you want to die of obesity and type two diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's and cancer? Because you absolutely will get those diseases if you continue to eat seed oils. Dr. Kate Shanahan, I am so happy to have you on the show because as we talked off air, I've been following your work for years now. And what impresses me, and you really are the leading expert in seed oils, which led you to write your latest book, Dark Calories. Well, you've been studying this for for decades, forever, for as long as I've been listening to you. So can you start with, and we'll get deep into the new book, but Can you just start with what prompted you in the beginning to go, you know what, I'm going to go down this rabbit hole of seed oils and just see what they do to the body? Yeah, well, it was because I had always wanted to get to the root cause of of some common conditions that medical science didn't really have a good answer to. And I selfishly just wanted really, but I went to medical school. My dream was to learn what about all these like sports injuries, uh, because I had been an athlete and I had suffered from every kind of itis. I had, you know, bursitis in my hip and in my heels and I had tendonitis and shin splints and on it went. And why me? And what, you know, why did I just go from one to the other? No answer in medical school, very disappointed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I went to become a family medicine doctor because uh, without the root causes, then at least, you know, what I felt like I could use my brain for was that um, mystery unraveling is like, how do you put the whole picture together of someone's, you know, life of different issues? Could they be related? And 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 being the, the person who's that medical detective, that was what appealed to me about family medicine, because we see, you know, cradle to grave. Um, I don't know if you're in Canada or not, but the term is like a GP up there. Are you in Canada? 
No, I'm in the U.S., but yeah, general practitioner, PCP right. here. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah. And so the there was still a third of my practice, though, that left me feeling really empty and hollow and really kind of despairing a little bit about my choice of career. And, and, and that was like the routine maintenance, what it's called when people just come back for refills, really, it was like refill medicine, you know, I was managing their hypertension, their cholesterol, their diabetes, and even things like asthma and thyroid disease, right? Like, you know, I, I was refilling prescriptions, they still needed the thyroid medicine, thyroid medicines work pretty well. So mm -hmm. that wasn't like too bad. That was actually one of the rare cases where the prescription refills actually seemed to do a good job. But the vast majority of the rest of them, no. And, and so I was feeling like, you know, people were ending up in the hospital, was I really doing anything with all these prescription refills? And I, I, it was a third of the day at least where I just kind of had to smile and nod when people, you know, said, you know, these drugs aren't making me feel any better. And then I had no like re resolution to this. I felt that there was something missing. I had no idea where to look until I got really sick myself and I suffered from a serious, serious illness that the medical industry had no answer for. I, I almost couldn't walk very much at all. And it really threatened my career. And like my boss, who was a mean person who's a, he's now long since retired. Um, I don't even know if he's alive anymore, but uh, he was like literally making fun of me and, you know, claiming that I was making up my issues because I didn't have a clear answer. And, and so with that, I was desperate to like, look for new angles. Right. And the new angle that I started was actually brought up by my husband who had been telling me for years that there was something about my diet that could be a problem, which was I had a major sweet tooth. And he compared my my diet. He said, I eat like an army of ants because of all the sugar I was mm -hmm. eating. And I, you know, I didn't think that could possibly be a problem because I hadn't learned that sugar be, could be a problem. So with that in mind, he gave me a book and the book had a term that completely changed my life forever. And that was essential fatty acids. And so in understanding what that was, that's where I started going down this, what has become a huge rabbit hole <laughs> of understanding that the seed oils, which are actually high in these beneficial essential fatty acids are actually not good for us because of X, Y, and Z reasons, which we'll go into. But like the, it blew my mind that I had not learned about them and that the fatty acids that I was taught were the unhealthy kinds, you know, the mm -hmm. saturated fats and butter because they raise your cholesterol, all that. Mm -hmm. When I started looking at the chemistry of essential fatty acids, I started realizing that, you know, butter is not likely to be the cause because saturated fats are not likely to be the cause chemically, you know, just looking at the chemistry of it. And so, so that was the beginning of it. And in my first book, uh, Deep Nutrition, I it was, was the first book to talk about how seed oils harm us at the membrane and cell levels because of oxidative stress. And no other book or author had written, like synthesized that. And so that attracted a lot of attention and even, a, you know, got me in the Lakers. There was a lot of news about it. And mm -hmm. a lot of people have read that book. And I really think that without that book, I don't think that seed oils today would be part of the conversation the way that they are. And so I'm grateful that the Lakers helped me really get the word out about how inflammatory these, these oils are and how bad they are for us. Well, yeah, I mean, you've changed the the whole landscape of talking about oils and seed oils, and just like you mentioned, saturated fat not so bad for us because it's it's real as opposed to let's say margarine that is totally chemically processed, canola oil, soybean oil. Now you term these oils the hateful eight. Can you go through what those oils are, and then we're obviously going to deep dive into what they actually do at the cell level. Yeah, if you can memorize these eight oils and avoid them, it will change your metabolism. It will change your life for the better. In fact, people literally say that to me in emails and <laughs> phone calls regularly. It changed my life. So the eight are corn, canola, cottonseed. And if you're not in the U.S., there's no canola. Actually, in Canada, there's canola. But it's rapeseed other places, other countries in the world. Soy, 
sunflower, and safflower. Now, those six are the most important to look for on labels because the other the next two I'm going to tell you are mostly in restaurants and they are rice bran and grapeseed oil. And uh, yeah, so those are the worst things in the food supply. They are uniquely bad for us. They are unlike anything humans have ever consumed. And the insane thing is that doctors still promote these as the healthy, the heart healthy oils Mm -hmm. because of how they lower cholesterol levels. And all of that is just not, not good science. Like the the fact that they do lower cholesterol levels, but the fact that that indicates that they are heart healthy is based on very bad, very flawed science. And doctors to this day are still learning it. And it's not doctors alone. It's dietitians and it's most people who have to get a license to practice anything related to health, including fitness Mm -hmm. and massage therapy. They, they kind of get indoctrinated in this saturated fat is bad mantra. So you will hear it everywhere. And that's why I had to write another book because I, I really, you really need to arm yourself with the truth because it's, there's so many folks out there who don't understand this information and are trying to shut the message down. Yeah. Well, it would be detrimental to, like you said, the restaurant industry and the whole big food, just like big pharma. We have the big food industry. So that would absolutely wreck them because these hateful eight oils are cheap. They're so much easier to get and they are, they are cheap. So in your last book, you talked about the hateful eight, but now in dark calories, your latest book, which I want to hear more about, you're really going deep into vegetable oils, literally destroying our life. So obviously you're, you're talking about the, the hateful eight and what they do. Why call this book Dark Calories? Well, because for three reasons. One is that these vegetable oils, these eight, compose 30% of the average person's daily calories, and doctors don't learn anything about it, and most people don't have any idea that they're eating that many of them. So it's like it's invisible. And, but then, you know, another big reason is that it's really, you know, I'm so glad you pointed out that the, the restaurant industry does not really want to make this change. But they're not the biggest losers. If people were to learn the truth, the biggest losers would be the healthcare industry. And that's what another reason why I call it dark, because it's the dark side of you know human nature. Even doctors who believe in what they're doing, they truly believe statin drugs are beneficial. They truly believe uh, uh, saturated fats will cause heart disease. The problem is that people don't know what they don't know. And that makes them dangerous when what they are taught is wrong. And then the other reason it's dark is because this is all intentional. This is all based on a lie. It's it's based on an ego. Like it's not like it was some mastermind who wanted to make us sick. But it's true that they're making lots of money out of the fact that we are sick and there's zero incentive to change it. So that's not going to happen until I think the solution is we educate more doctors. Because although a lot of us are just kind of like, and health practitioners of all sorts, like you, like Mm -hmm. yourself, and functional medicine doctors who don't learn the extent of what these things do. You know, when I first, um, well, it's a little tangent. I went to a functional medicine meeting, um, several of them actually, more than 10 years ago now. I brought up, hey, what about vegetable seed oils? They're like, they're heart healthy. (laughs) So they really don't know. They really are just sort of scrambling to catch up with the science and to present it as though they are experts, but they're honestly not. They they have not. If they're not aware of oxidative stress and all the things that are coming out to the world in this book, then they just don't know. And they don't know what they don't know. And a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. That's what nutrition science is right now for most doctors and dietitians out there. And um, that's why I want to shed some light. So thank you for helping, inviting me onto the show and helping out. Oh, no, listen, we have to spread this because you know what? I, I see this all the time, even in the world of thyroid and hormones. And I speak about this on my podcast a ton is, even though you see the term functional or integrative, it doesn't mean that they are. It's almost become a buzzword, a marketing term 
that people will use, whether they're a, a medical doctor turning supposedly functional or a you know a nutritionist or fun, using that term, but but they're not practicing that way. They're still practicing in that sick medicine world. So to the consumer, and that's what you're doing is education. Yes, we have to educate the doctors, but we also have to educate the consumers to think for themselves and to question the statements that even practitioners that they're working with, functional, non-functional, give to you the information that they give. Like you said, a little information is dangerous and, and really start to do your own research and be your own health advocate in that. Yes. And, you know, I wrote dark calories because I want everyone who is a patient also, as well as doctors to understand that th these, most of the diseases we're suffering from everything from obesity to thyroid uh, autoimmune disease, you know, thyroid mm -hmm. disease, which is the autoimmune disease is driving most thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and all, all sorts of autoimmune diseases, whether it's celiac or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis, degenerative nerve diseases mm -hmm. like Huntington's dis disorder and psychiatric conditions. These all come from one simple cellular state of imbalance. And that is what I want people to understand that state that is called oxidative stress. And uh, the vegetable oils are oxidative stress in a bottle. They are the, there are other factors out there that promote oxidative stress. And, you know, things like lack of exercise, cigarette smoking, drinking way too much alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, nutrient deficient diet. But vegetable oils are the number one driver. They're more powerful than sugar. And they are the most important thing to educate yourself about and to avoid and to focus on them first and foremost if you're having difficulty being you know, feeling bombarded with all the things you're hearing are bad for you, please focus first and foremost on the on the hateful eight vegetable oils because I guarantee you that's eighty percent of the, every change that you need to make. Well, you'll start feeling better when you just avoid the oils. And you know when we're talking, you said something about obesity, and in reading this book. Uh, first of all, we know that obesity is really the biggest cause of, of all cause mortality and disease because that's going to increase a person's risk of heart disease and of cancer and on and on and on. But what I what I found interesting in dark calories was that seed oils can actually feed fat cells and cause metabolic chaos, cause insulin resistance, cause an inflamed liver that we know is going to contribute to excess accumulation of body fat. And it, you know, we focus so much on carbs these days. And I mean, even I do, right? If you're, if you're insulin resistant, yeah. you're type two diabetic, let's pull back on those carbs, but maybe we have to shift our focus to the seed oils because it sounds like they do more damage than even sugar can do. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, Dr. Amy, that you really understood the, you know, the main, one of the main points of the book, because I do want to help people make that shift because, for the simple reason that there's this thing called metabolic sugar addiction that, you know, my, that's what I propose in the book that we are not just looking for sugar for its taste anymore. You see, I myself actually had insulin resistance, mm -hmm. you know, 25 years ago, and, and I didn't know it. I didn't know what the signs were. I didn't know what the symptoms were. And, you know, I had no idea that it was coming from the seed oils that were in my diet and oxidative stress that, that, that they were driving and other deficiencies in my diet. But um, what's going on today with obesity is the conversation is very different than what it was 30 years ago. Because when I first graduated from medical school, obesity wasn't a risk factor for mortality. And it is now. It is. And it's not that the science has progressed. It's that our body fat has changed because our food supply has changed and these vegetable oils reformulate our body fat. So back 30 years ago, we had about a third of the vegetable oils in our food supply. And that was reflected in our body fat. Mm -hmm. That was, that did not, was not quite as reformulated as it is today. The problem is so much worse today. That's why we have more obesity. And now being overweight is mostly driven by the, the abnormal, abnormal appetite that comes from having reformulated body fat. Like mm -hmm. the, the rate of obesity is 
way more than it was when I was in medical school. It was, you know, fractional. It was like, you know, maybe four or five percent. And and now it, it's like 30 percent. Right. So it's so much worse than it was. And it's actually a different disease than it was. And that's my point is that back in the day, most people who were overweight, it was due to empty calorie carbohydrates, sugar and alcohol and these high calorie dense foods that had no nutrition and were addicting in one way, shape or form. So you would overconsume them, right? People, some people are just prone to certain addictions and so a minority of people. So that's why, you know, we dial it back a hundred years, we still had sugar and flour and alcohol in the food supply, but our rates of obesity were less than 1%. Right, exactly. So so the, the body fat that people built back then, when those were the drivers and it wasn't the seed oils reformulating our body fat, it wasn't inflammatory. It was fat that if they got rid of those things they were overeating, they could easily burn it. They were not metabolically addicted to the sugars. They were just addicted for the taste. Now it's a whole different ball game. And this is, you know, this is what I think is the most important discovery in, in dark calories. And that is this idea that your body fat, you build body fat that you can't burn. And that's because your cells literally don't want it. They prefer sugar. When your cells prefer sugar, you have a metabolic addiction that will drive your taste addictions even further. So no amount of willpower. And that's why it's so important to understand that these oils are doing this because people will blame themselves. They will feel like they lack willpower. They'll feel like they failed when they try a, you know, a low carb diet that doesn't emphasize the importance of the right kinds of fats. And even what I talk about in the book, paying attention to your, your hunger. What mm -hmm. kind of hunger symptoms do you have? Because normal hunger and what I call pathologic hunger driven by the seed oils are very different things. And when you don't have normal hunger, you are damaged metabolically. You are, your cells need carbohydrates. And, and if you don't get them, some very, very bad things may be happening that, you know, we don't know for sure, but I have this concern because I've worked with so many people who just couldn't do keto. They never got through the low carb flu. Right. And like this, so this explains why that happens to some people. And it's a revolutionary way to get people towards the, the that healthy diet and to be able to produce ketones a healthy way, not an unhealthy way. Well, that was the biggest thing that blew my mind in the book was that we could have these fat cells that are literally resistant to being burnt. They just stay there. And I always think when I'm when I'm interviewing someone, I think about questions from the perspective of what I see in practice or issues that my patients are having. And so I think about that woman that we've optimized her thyroid, we've balanced her hormones, everything looks great on paper, but she still isn't releasing the fat. And now you're really making me think about diving granularly into her diet, not just macronutrient counting, how many carbs are you taking in a day, but really getting granular with what she's eating because if these seed oils are in her diet, that could be the answer as to why her body isn't releasing the fat. So I guess my next question for you is by eliminating the seed oils, can we then get our bodies to eventually release the fat that we've built up from decades of eating this garbage? Yes. And now here's a thing that is a, a little nuance, but it's really important. Your cells will release the fat. Your, your fat cells will release the fat. Okay. Like I know that that's kind of a, a common assumption out there that if you're insulin resistant, the insulin traps the fat in the fat closet and so on. But the fat cells release the fat, and that's why people's triglycerides are high and their HDL is low. So that that's actually happening. So and and don't feel bad for not knowing that because like this, I'm I'm revising everything that people have been talking about for the last fifteen years, and I did not spell it out quite exactly this way in the book. So this is why I need to go on podcasts because there's a lot of concepts and we need to nail them to uh, to understand them. So what's going on is that the fat cells will release fat fatty acids mm -hmm. that 
that the, our other cells that need energy, you know, our muscles, our brain cells, or even our skin cells, our gut cells, you name it, our thyroid cells, that those cells do not want to pick up, right? That because what happens when those fatty acids from the polyunsaturated fatty acids that have come from the seed oils get into our cells mitochondria where energy is produced, it damages the mitochondria, shuts down energy production, free radicals start flying around. It's a disaster. It promotes inflammation. It promotes oxidative stress. It accelerates, you know, every disease you can name. Mm -hmm. That's bad. So the cells are on the verge of, you know, death and dying themselves. To stay alive, they have to resort to sugar in your bloodstream. So sugar is like the savior for people who are insulin resistant, for their cells, for your cells. If you have, are listening and you have insulin resistance, you know, if you have type two diabetes, you definitely have insulin resistance. If you're pre-diabetic, you definitely have insulin resistance. A lot yeah. of people are, are insulin resistant and are not yet to that stage of pre-diabetes, right. so they don't know. But if you have high triglycerides, low HDL, big abdominal growth, and you know the other signs. Um, if you have hypothyroidism, you're insulin resistant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically almost 100% overlap there. Then, then you are insulin resistant. And, and that means that sugar is actually your cellular savior. Okay. So this is why it's so important to understand what a sugar addiction means, what a metabolic sugar addiction means. Because if you cut out, like, say you go full on carnivore, right? And you have not a shred of glucose. Mm -hmm. Well, now your, your bodies are going to, going to be converting the protein. All, you have to get all of the sugar that you need because your cells need it now, right? When, right. when you're healthy, your cells need some sugar, but very little, you know, our red blood cells cannot metabolize fat. Certain cells in the cornea cannot metabolize fat. Certain cells in the kidney and other parts of our body cannot metabolize fat and do require sugar. So we have a very small requirement for sugar. That's why there's always one of the reasons there's always some in the bloodstream. But when we have insulin resistance, that requirement for sugar doubles or triples or goes up four or 10 times. And that means that if we don't eat carbs, then we're forcing our bodies to burn protein instead. Okay. And that yep. is that is very dangerous. Yeah, we don't because want that. Amino acids, they're also somewhat dangerous. Our kidneys have to do a lot to reverse engineer them to make them sugar. And you know, our kidneys and our liver cooperate to, co to convert protein into sugar. We don't have any sugar stores in our body, but our body can do this amazing transformation between you know, protein and meat or protein wherever in your diet and turn it into sugar. But how wasteful is that? For a cow to sacrifice its life when you could have just had gotten some of the carbohydrate from a plant, right? That's mm -hmm. it's so wasteful and so not health, healthful for our organs. There's so many reasons why not understanding the truth about insulin resistance has been detrimental to people and society. And so I we don't need loads of sugar or carbohydrates are in our diet. But I do believe that, you know, when you're really metabolically damaged, you need some. And and how much? Well, my my the way from working with people, I keep people somewhere between somewhere around 70 grams and 100 grams when they're just starting. Mm -hmm. And then I dial it back a little bit. But I don't usually go under 50 until their, you know, triglycerides and HDL have equalized and they're basically no longer so insulin resistant. And, and so that, that tells you some very important things. It's like, you know, we've got some markers here for what, how, when we need more carbs and the blood tests are one, one yep. of the very important markers. So I, I just want people to, to take, learn how, you know, to take charge of your health and your metabolism because your doctor won't help you. Your doctor doesn't know any of this. No, no. And it's going to be one extreme or the other. I mean, you, you and I approach it the exact same way. I, 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 that's why I'm smiling over here as you're talking because I, I too, I'll, I'll start someone 70 to 100 grams of carbohydrates in the beginning, even if they are insulin resistant and, and dial it back as we move along because there's really no need to go to 20 grams or 30 grams of carbohydrates. I mean, maybe you do a couple days of that just to, to cycle your carbs, but to stay on that long term, I agree. The body is eventually going to start breaking down that vital protein that we need that most women aren't getting enough of that anyways. So that's the last thing we want is for the body to actually utilize that and break it down into sugar. Okay. This isn't something that's 
talked about enough, but did you know that your body actually runs on electricity and electrical impulses that move your cells and move your blood and really are the triggers for life? But today we're exposed to a crazy amount of non-native polarizing EMF fields. You've heard about these, the 5G cellular our computers, even the wearable devices, the Wi-Fi in your home, that constant bombardment of EMF radiation causes stress on the body at a cell level. So now the thyroid's affected, your sleep is affected, cortisol, memory, brain function, and yeah, the ability to lose weight can actually be affected by EMF. So what can we do about it? I've gone down the rabbit hole of EMF protection. I got to tell you, I'm not going to wear the ugly clothes. I'm not going to wrap myself in a blanket when it's 90 degrees outside. I needed something practical. So I found EMF rocks. And I know it sounds crazy. It's a bag of rocks, right? But trust me, when you go down the rabbit hole of science of EMF rocks, they protect you and your entire home, depending on where you place them. So if you want more details on this, you can listen to my podcast with Justin Franson of EMF Rocks. We went into the science. He even surprised me by telling me that driving an electric car is like driving in a microwave. So you're going to want to listen to the episode. But in a nutshell, EMF Rocks are grounding bags that you put at the foot of your desk, at your bed, throughout your home to literally protect you 24-7 from that constant bombardment of EMF. And that simple strategy that doesn't require you to wear ugly clothes is just enough to protect your body and help it to work better, help all your cells to work better, help your thyroid work better. So what you're going to do is go to EMF rocks, EMF R O C K S.com backslash Dr. Amy D R A M I E. It's going to save you some money on grabbing some EMF rock bags, the grounding bags for yourself let me know how you feel after you use these, because I think you're going to notice, I know you're going to notice massive shifts in your body, including your weight. And then you also mentioned air hunger. You mentioned it before, and I want to kind of come back to that. Well, the term that's circulating around social media is air hunger. And really, there's no full description of it, except like you mentioned, just this hunger that is occurring that isn't correlated to not eating or actually being hungry. It's this abnormal, just constant state of hunger and, and sugar cravings that people are experiencing. Most, I would say, health practitioners correlate that to, oh, you're eating too much sugar, you're eating too many carbohydrates, but that might not be the case because I've also heard people say, no, I'm not. I'm watching my sugars, I'm watching my carbs and I still have this, this air hunger. So that is also tied back to these seed oils. Yeah. So the term that I used in the book is pathologic hunger, um, because I learned, you know, I don't know what the internet is saying about air hunger these days, but the doctors learned that air hunger is actually a totally different thing. It's you're truly needing oxygen because you have heart failure, right? So, so people, it's a totally different thing in my, uh, in my right. Not world. hungry for air, but exactly. I see it in my Facebook group. People are like, does anyone else experience this air hunger, meaning hungry all the time? Yeah, that is a weird thing. I've not heard that term. So thank you for educating me on that. Um, so, but yeah, like I've heard terms that mean the same thing, like food noise, right? Mm -hmm. That like you always have this food noise in your head. And so, so what I'm, uh, the term I'm coining is pathologic hunger because there's normal hunger, which really just means it's about the time that you normally eat. Your digestive system is preparing to break down the food and turn it into you. That's the process of nourishing your body. It's not an emergency, but pathologic hunger is an emergency. It's an energy deficiency. It's an energy crisis in your cells, specifically your brain cells, because they need sugar. Like your other cells, they they can use you know other fuels, um, but your brain cells, that's like your canary in the coal mine for, for metabolic disease. And this pathologic hunger includes symptoms of, it's not always that you're hungry every minute necessarily, but it can feel like it because you you will be like, well, I just ate two hours ago. Why am I starting to think about food again? Right. Well, yep. that happens when your blood sugar starts to drop, even before it gets very low. But that happens as your blood sugar starts to drop because you've 
you're you've taken the nutrients from your digestive system. There's no no longer any more calories that you can burn, you know, whether it be it fats from your diet or proteins or even carbohydrates. They're not in, coming out into your bloodstream anymore. So now you have to go back to your body fat. And that body fat, your cells don't want it. So they're using sugar. So that's when your sugar starts to drop and it's causing these pathologic hunger symptoms. Just two, three, four hours. And what people do is they, well, they feel miserable and they push through and they start to get hangry and they might get brain fog. They might get a headache, right? When people have seizure disorders, very often a seizure is triggered by not being able to eat when they start to feel hangry. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if you ever heard that, but um, I've seen that in so many patients with um, seizure disorders. Mm -hmm. That is your brain having a severe crisis. It triggers an anxiety attacks. And there's 11 symptoms that I teach people to track in dark calories. Those 11 symptoms of pathologic hunger are, are telling you that you're insulin resistant, that your body can't burn its body fat, that your blood sugar is dropping, and that your brain cells are in a state of crisis. And at that point, yeah, you kind of do need to eat something. It's, you may as well just eat something, right? And what I recommend is like have something that has a little bit of carbohydrate in it, but not, don't overdo it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. A different strategy. The real strategy is preventing those symptoms from happening in the first place. And that's what I talk about in the last third of the book is let's get you meals that immediately suppress that air hunger or food noise or whatever you want to call it. Right, right. <laughs> The pathological <laughs> hunger. Well, I'm glad that you go into in the book things that people can actually tune into their own bodies and notice as opposed to you have to go get these labs done. You're actually giving people things to think about that they can easily check off themselves at home and 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 say, do I have these things going on? And will that will that guide me in, hey, maybe I should keep reading the book to figure out what I should do to diminish these symptoms as opposed to having to go out and beg their doctor for a set of labs. I mean, labs are nice, but I love that you get into those, those 11 kind of checklist things that people can pay attention to. Yeah, I do that because first of all, I want everybody to be able to do this and right. you know, not everybody can get, has the time to take away from their day to get into a doctor or even to get into the labs. You got to schedule those ahead. You got to be fasting, yada, yada. It's not easy. And, right. and the other reason is that is what I want you to pay attention to. How are you feeling? Because it's so much more important that you've improved your brain's energy levels than that you've lost pounds on the scale mm -hmm. because you're not ready for that. I know people who want to lose weight. They, they want, they feel better about themselves when they start to see those numbers go down, but that is keeping you trapped. If that's your mindset, that is unfortunately somewhat keeping you trapped because when you are losing weight before your body is metabolically ready to do that, you're basically burning your lean mass. You, you know, and this is what Ozempic is showing us. This is, you know, sort of the, the Ozempic is giving us a lot of lessons that no one's paying attention to. You know, everybody being on Ozempic and finally being able to lose weight. We'll, we've unfortunately found that the weight is not coming off from your body fat the way you think it is. It's, you're starting to burn your muscle. You're starting to lose, you're no doubt going to be losing bone density. No doubt we're going to see a um, an epidemic of, bone breakages and just bizarre things happening. I, I'm worried we're going to see cancer. Probably we'll see more dementia, you know, partly because of the Ozempic, partly just because people are continuing to eat seed oils. And, you know, I, I want to nip that in the bud. <laughs> no, I'm glad you mentioned that because really one of the the first line of of defense against this air hunger and obesity epidemic is give them Ozempic, give them the GLPs. And, you know, I played around with it because all of us in this space, biohackers, we'll, we'll experiment on ourselves for sure, whether it's good or bad. We'll inject ourselves with anything. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so I wanted to try it when it first came out. When it very first came out, I wanted to try the Manjaro, Trisepatide, just to see, okay, what's up with this? What will it do for patients? And it wasn't two weeks after Peter Atia released an article saying, hey, we're seeing some lean muscle mass loss with this. I'm like, no. And then I swear to you, I got my mother's arms. You know, like I was losing muscle and the skin was accumulating, you know, and you're like, oh my God, I lost muscle tissue. 
So yes, a hundred percent. I'm I'm with you there. And what if we just changed our diet? What if we just eliminated seed oils? Like I would challenge people to do that. Eliminate, read the book, eliminate seed oils, see what happens to your body. Don't do anything else. You don't have to up your exercise. You don't even, you know, you don't even have to get sleep every day. Well, you probably should get at least six to eight hours, but eliminate seed oils and see what happens to your body instead of going on the GLPs. Right. Actually, I have a two week challenge in there and everything that you need to know to like build yourself a little shopping list and a little mini menu. And actually there's downloads too, that you can get an actual menu. And yeah, so take the challenge. And I bet you're going to, if you're tracking those pathologic hunger symptoms, I would be surprised if you don't start feeling better in just that two week time period, because the, the, in fact, some people start feeling better in the first few days or the very first day, you know, mm-hmm. depending what you were eating, right? If you right. were eating, you know, a, a, a banana and low fat yogurt and you have a more sustaining meal, you're going to feel better immediately, right? Mm-hmm. So, and that's the kind of thing that is very simple to start feeling way better. And I, I want to maybe like just emphasize a tiny bit the difference between having energy in your brain and not having energy, you know, like, and you mentioned sleep. So, you know, we don't wake up feeling energized. If we had had a bad night's sleep, you know, just got two, three hours, you know, we feel terrible, but after a really good night's sleep, you feel so much better. Well, you know, you've reduced oxidative stress and you've improved your brain's ability to generate energy there. And when you wake up with energy, how much more, confident are you, you know, as you're going, ticking, thinking of all the things that you've got to do, right? If you don't have energy, just little things can feel overwhelming. But if you have tons of energy, you feel like, hey, bring it on. I can handle it. And yeah. and that's what you, that's the state that you need to be in because the truth is there's no easy fix. There's no easy formula. There's no easy solution. What you have to do is you have to be Come what I call, you know, food self sufficient. You have to be confident enough to be able to throw quick meals together so that you don't have to go to those golden arches or, you know, reach in the sack for a whole bunch of processed food. But in order to, if you're not there now, it's a big change and energy, it's going to be fueled by energy. Now you're mentioning energy and you're mentioning the brain. And I know we've been focused on obesity and weight and, and the fat cells. But what about the impact on on the brain from these seed oils? I mean, obviously, my my patient population, my audience also suffers from mood swings and anxiety, depression, brain fog, memory loss, obviously low energy throughout the day, extreme fatigue. How are seed oils connected to those symptoms as well? So those symptoms are exaggerated by blood sugar highs and lows, right? So mm-hmm. when you when you eat the healthy fats and build the sustaining meals with just a little bit of carbohydrates in them, you flatten out those highs and those lows. And that is the key to getting control over your mental well-being, really. You know, there are psychiatrists now who are starting centers for metabolic brain medicine Mm -hmm. that are, are using the keto diet you know, because they don't know really that they should be focusing on seed oils. Right. <laughs> I hate to say, but that's true. Where it's where we're at right now. You know, but they are having great success even with not focusing on seed oils. They're having people who've been diagnosed with serious disorders, bipolar disorder, and major, major depression and um schizophrenia. Uh, you know, these these are life altering diseases, and they're having successes. Not a hundred percent, possibly because they're not, you know, paying attention to the right things, but, um, but they are having successes when this is unheard of in psychiatry. Mm-hmm. Like most people, this it's so bad. Psychi- psychiatric medicine is so ineffective that most people who go into a psychiatric hospital, um, they, they leave with way more medications than they came in on. And then they start gaining weight because of the medications. Yeah. But a few years ago, a psychiatrist who wrote one of the books that's circulating out now, her name's George Ede, she noticed that putting people on a keto diet, and she did pay attention to seed oils a little bit, that people put the, putting them on a keto diet while in the hospital, they would actually leave on fewer medicines than they came in with. Again, unheard of. 
Yeah. So, you know, you may not have severe major depression, but let me tell you a story about like my life when I was still insulin resistant. I had, I didn't have major depression. I didn't have major anxiety, but I had brain fog and I didn't call it that because I didn't realize how energy blows were affecting my brain. I would come home from work and my husband would ask me a simple question. Hey, how was your day? And, uh, and I would get grouchy because I was like, you know what? I don't remember a thing. And, and I would be like, I could struggle to answer the question and I would be mad at him for asking me such a vague question when it's a perfectly normal question, you know? And, and it was like it, that I thought that was just my personality. I took that on, you know, that, oh, I get grouchy when people ask me questions about how, like, basically, how are you feeling? How was your day? Tell me about your day. Mm -hmm. Like, I really felt terrible about myself for that. Yeah. And so there, it's these little things, these little lapses that have these, these huge ripple effects impacting our behavior and our self-esteem. So I wanted to share that story just to make the point that, you know, if once you tap into optimizing your brain energy and paying attention to that, you're going to realize that that is so much more of a powerful thing to do to improve your quality of life immediately than pay attention to that number on the scale. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, I have the the set of patients too that come in and they they even say, listen, I don't even care about the weight. I just want my right. life and my energy and my brain back and my mood back because if that comes back, then I can better even focus on myself, on on meditation, on exercise, on even eating and, and purchasing and making the right foods. But when you're in that low energy state and and you can share if you were you were there too, I mean, at, with having a practice and being a doctor and then you're coming home from a long day, you were probably just reaching for the nearest thing. If your husband didn't have dinner ready on the table, right? You were just reaching for anything to just feed the the brain to get more energy. Well, for me, um, I come from a line of compulsive exercisers. So for oh, me, yeah. what I did for energy was I would go for yeah. a run because that boosts up your cortisol and your adrenaline, gets that blood sugar up. But unfortunately, it was also coming from, you know, probably my own muscle more and more than it was because I could never I could never really build muscle very well, you know. So like for, for me, I did have a bunch of extra pounds that I lost when I changed my diet. But that, you know, wasn't my solution as much as exercise. I was an extremely compulsive exerciser and, you know, fighting injuries was a big problem because I, I would tr I would feel this need to exercise even when I was injured from exercising. So it just was so frustrating that I would never heal. And oh gosh, it was not good for me. Mm -hmm. Now I got you. We're we're so I'm, I'm learning that we're so much so very similar throughout this conversation <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> because no, I I did the same thing. I did the same thing and. Uh, yeah, I get it. Well, on the lines of, I, I want to come back to cancer because this is a big one. And, and there's a couple of things in the book that I know are going to blow people's mind. But since you're on the injury topic, even that you're seeing improvement on. And when the Lakers brought you on, you made some pretty big shifts in high level athletes, including Kobe Bryant, that changed their career because they were not getting injured and then healing from injuries really quickly. Yeah. So yeah, because the oils are inflammatory and because they drive sugar cravings, you combine these inflammatory oils with the spikes of sugar that these big guys there that, you know, they would polish off a big gulp. No problem. Even if you don't have type 2 diabetes, that much sugar is going to spike your blood sugar and start glycating your joints. Uh, you know, that's the harm that sugar does. But the inflammatory effect from the oxidative stress from the vegetable oils would make it so that just a normal workout, you know, they would kind of have to recover from that. And a normal workout could cause pain and inflammation and start breaking down their connective tissues. So one of the best stories was when Dwight Howard, he'd had back surgery in the summer before the season where I first started working with them and he hadn't healed. And he, it was getting worse actually. And, and he was getting, he had numbness and tingling in his feet and he had pain in his back and he was starting to get problems in his hands that no one could explain. And all of that was coming from the oxidative stress affecting his nerves. And the pain part of it was 
the inf inflammatory response there coming from the vegetable oils promoting oxidative stress that also promote inflammation. And so he he was doing very poorly. And he, there was a big Twitter war between him and Kobe, and they were calling, they were calling him soft and he was trying to defend himself and saying, oh, I had back surgery. I didn't recover. Ugh, big battle. It was terrible for the, you know, it was tough on the team too. Right. And so we had a major intervention. We got him off of his vegetable oil and his sugar you know, largely. And two weeks later, the headlines, the sports headlines were saying Superman is back because his nickname was Superman. And so literally it was in the headlines is how powerfully getting off these seed oils helps your body deal with inflammation. That is so powerful. I'm, I'm even thinking again, here, here I am bringing back in my patients and thinking through the different cases. And, you know, you hear a lot of stories about eliminating gluten and how people notice a huge shift in their joint pain or muscle pain, injury recovery when they eliminate gluten. But then you have that subset of people that are like, you know, I, I did the whole gluten-free thing and I did it the right way with real foods. And, you know, it's just still, but yet they're still using things that have these, hidden oils in them and they are still experiencing pain. So I think for those people, for any listener out there that is experiencing joint inflammation, you had mentioned rheumatoid arthritis, any kind of a, the itises, do the seed oil challenge, dive into elimination of these oils and see how you feel. I mean, you don't have to be a full-blown athlete to have an injury that can sideline your life, your day-to-day -day life. So I think this is great. And again, it's a simple, basically free, because you're just swapping one food for the other. You still have to eat. Free solution of how to radically, radically change your health and your symptoms. And if you have not ever been diagnosed with cancer, I believe that you can become basically cancer-proof. I mean, you can totally fortify your body and rad radically reduce the risk. And this, this is actually, there is a segue here from athletes to cancer, believe it or not, because the main source of inflammation is, it, right, in a day-to-day -day, like life when you're on seed oils is exercise because your mitochondria burn more oxygen and put out more free radicals those are the things that cause inflammation while you're exercising. And they do that when they're burning off body fat that is pro-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that when your diet has depleted your body of the things that fight free radicals called antioxidants, right? So we now know, what does this have to do with cancer? What does mitochondria have to do with cancer? I thought cancer was genetic, right? Right. So, well, actually, a long time ago, a scientist named Otto Warburg just before World War II, discovered, made huge discoveries that suggested that cancer might actually not have anything, not originate in DNA, but that DMA, DNA break, breakages found in cancer patients came from the free radicals shooting out of the mitochondria. And the mitochondrial damage was really the main driver. In other words, cancer too is a metabolic disease that we have control over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because he was from Germany and World War II, afterwards, everybody hated Germany. That just disappeared from the conversation. And yeah. it's, now being, it's now being revived by like a brilliant scientist who's, who wrote his own book called Cancer is Metabolic Disease. It's like a four, four pound book. And it's an academic book. But I, I interviewed him for Dark Calories, and he's using keto to treat cancer. I'm thinking, though, that, if, you know, now that we have good science suggesting that, you know, we've been wrong, that cancer is not genetic, it really originates in mitochondrial damage. If you can keep your mitochondria healthy, then that means you can become cancer proof. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I think we are seeing more and more these days, as more literature comes out, that really cancer is less about genetics and so much more about lifestyle factors and nutrition. Yeah. Yep. Even in the mainstream medicine, they're starting to acknowledge that, but you know, they are not able to make that leap because that, that it's coming from oxidative stress and vegetable oils is because they don't learn about oxidative stress. Doctors don't learn that term. That's a term that, path, that a tiny subset, some doctors do, the pathologists and the toxicologists who study, they're called like the, the doctor's doctors because pathologists 
are the guys who look at slides and try to understand the root causes of diseases. And so the pathologists have found oxidative stress associated with Alzheimer's, associated with Parkinson's, you know, those plaques and tangles that you get um, in your brain that are the marker of Alzheimer's. They're also there from traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Those are oxidized proteins, oxidative stress is the cause there. And yes. so, you know, on down the alphabetical list of diseases, it's all associated with oxidative stress. So this is just so empowering. I think it's just so important to realize what control you have over your future and over your well-being today. Once you just reframe the whole idea about what causes disease and dive a little bit into understanding what is oxidative stress? Where does it come from? And how's the diet? What's the diet going to do to control that? That's the answer. Well, and one of the biggest things that blew me away in the book, you know, as I'm reading and I'm, I'm writing these these mind blowing notes and to really drive home the point of the injury that these seed oils can do to our bodies. Inhaling seed oils has been shown to cause lung cancer. Can you expand on that? Because that just, that total, I'm like, oh my gosh, if that's the case, then when we ingest them, what the hell are we doing to our insides? Right. So, so what you're inhaling when you're cooking over a deep fryer or when you're doing like some frying at home and you're getting the, the, the oxidation products of the polyunsaturates that come mostly from seed oils, mm -hmm. they're broken down, they're oxidized. So it's not the intact seed oils. It's, these are the toxins that, that develop during the heating of these types of fatty acids that seed oil, that doctors believe are healthy, the polyunsaturates. Seed oils are very high in those. The traditional fats that are more saturated, even olive oil, they don't break down this way. They don't turn into these volatile compounds that are toxic that we inhale. These volatile compounds can also enter our food. They can also, you know, they, if they stay in the food, they're small molecules, right? So oxygen breaks big molecules into small ones. Very a simple concept, right? I think that makes this intuitive. So that, that's the problem here. And these oxygen is very good at breaking down polyunsaturates. And polyunsaturates are very easy to break. Saturates are almost oxygen resistant. They stay intact. They stay as the nutrients and the things that nature made. Broken bits of molecules are toxic. Some of them are volatile, meaning they're so small that they, they're they essentially gases and you can breathe them in. But these small molecules also enter, penetrate your food as well because they are smaller and more mobile. So you're eating these toxins, you're inhaling these toxins, they're depleting your antioxidants, they're destroying your gut. That is like the first line of defense there. Right. So I think that's why we're having so much, you know, so many people with just food intolerances, children, especially mm -hmm. that can't eat so many things. But so that's what's happening, folks. Yes, th there's toxicity when we don't understand what we're eating and doctors have been misunderstanding and misrepresenting the harms in the food supply for 70 years. And I tell the origin story of this misunderstanding because I think it's very important to understand just how deeply uh, corrupted medical science has become because of this misunderstanding. And believe me, I have, I have so many other questions for you, but I know we're running short on time. So people just have to read the book. That That is a fascinating story of what the origin is of, of these seed oils and just you know, the whole follow the money trail and and everything, every every rabbit hole that we can go down that way. But I'll just let people read the book and and hear that story for themselves. But what you're doing is just, it's so impactful to the world. I mean, really, after this conversation, after reading the book, I firmly believe that this is a change that needs to be across the board. Every person needs to hear this. Every person needs to do this. It's not that hard of a change to do. You know, with the whole gluten-free thing, people are like, but I like my pasta and I don't like the gluten-free pasta, right? But this, this you're not going to notice changing right. from a bad oil to a good oil. It's not going to change the taste of your food. You know, you're not going to feel deprived, like you're missing out on your favorite thing. This is something that could tremendously impact your life now and in the future. What are you going to die of? Are you going to die of old age? Or are you going to die of Alzheimer's or cancer? I, I mean, that's the question. Exactly. It is. It's just, it's a matter of 
what is your number, which number is going to come up for you? What are your genetics? But there's no question you're going to get some kind of a disease if you stay on this disease inducing diet. Yeah. So it's so worth it. And uh, to, to learn to empower yourself, you'll feel so good about yourself to learn just a few little uh, tricks of how to basically reconstitute your cooking, your kitchen skills and make your own meals for that fast food, junk food independence. That's really the ticket to long-term success. I love it. And I love that you give people that answer in the book because it's not all doom and gloom. I know we had kind of a doom and gloom conversation, but but I wanted it that way because I want to scare people. I want people to, to be scared awake so that they can make the changes and they can make the changes that you recommend in the book. So we're obviously going to put the links to where everyone can find you and the link to get the book as well, but just verbally tell people where they can find you, where they can find your book, where they can hear you talk more. And what do you have going on besides just doing the whole circuit of promotion of dark calories? (laughs) So mostly that right now, but um, so please visit my website for (laughs) when that changes. My website is drkate.com, D-R-C-A-T-E.com. And scroll to the bottom, subscribe to my newsletter, which comes out once a month. But that'll update you with anything else that I come up with to help implement these changes. You know, the practical stuff, the necessary need to know stuff that I send you in my newsletter. And then also I'm on social. So you can find other podcasts on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even LinkedIn. And it's the same handle everywhere. It's at Dr. Kate Shanahan and it's D-R-C-A-T-E Shanahan. Thank you, Amy, for linking to those. Absolutely. We'll put all that in the show notes. And thank you today for your time. Thank you for writing this second book. And it's it's just needed. I'm, I'm very appreciative because it's needed in the world. Well, thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you found it useful, really. Absolutely. 